I'm a converted gold guy. I mean, for Bitcoin, gold was sound money. There wasn't, it was the only good choice. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Bitcoin's going to replace that, but um, not overnight. There was a whole sound money movement before Satoshi did his thing and gifted us with uh, the invention of Bitcoin. And uh, we've been fighting since 71 when we went off the gold standard. I mean, I was a teenager in 71. But the point is that sound money is, is a, an old concept, or it's a concept that's been around a while. Austrian economics has been around a while, um, and as a result, uh, what's really exciting for us older gold guys is like the reinforcements arrived. <laughs> you know, like you know, in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yeah, we've been fighting this battle since 1971, wow. you know, on and off, and it got cumulatively more heated. I would say we were kind of winning, but kind of losing. I mean, it's been an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. And then Bitcoin came along, and it's like, oh my God, we got this really, really good weapon. Hello and welcome to another episode of You Are The Voice. <laughs> Today I have the great pleasure to sit with Lawrence Larry L Lawrence. Lepard. Either one. Yeah, Larry's fine. Yeah. Larry's fine. Yeah. Larry Lepard. Um, thanks for being with me. Oh, Larry. great. It's an honor and fun to be with you. Yeah. And so good for us to be here. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, Madeira's not too hard to take. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So we're in Madeira. Portugal is yeah. an island just off the coast of Morocco, actually. Right. And um, it's my first time here. Is it your first? I, no, it's actually the second. I came uh, for the first one, a uh, smaller group. With together. the president. And um, we're here because tomorrow starts the Bitcoin Atlantis conference Correct. Yeah. that we're both uh, taking part of and a few other thousands of people. Yeah, I've heard. Yeah. It's big and it's beautiful. And we've got the best weather, so it's a really great time to be here. It really is. And it's going to be a great cast of characters, too. Andre Loja, who put this whole thing together, is a local Madeiran and hardcore Bitcoiner. I just interviewed and, him. Oh, did you? Before, He's yes, fabulous. You. Yeah. And uh, he has really done a, a lot for this island and, and a lot for the cause of Bitcoin. And the fact that he was able to attract all these people to come here, it's really, it's great. And it's, um, yeah. it's unusual, I think. He attracted a lot of big names yep. and a lot of audience because of that. And I think he talked about you guys, that you yeah. helped him put this together. Well, he did all the work. But he, yeah, he had a vision of um, orange pilling. Uh, the president of Madeira, and uh, and I think he has. I mean, effectively, um, as um, for those who aren't familiar, Portugal um, has um, I think three kind of principalities: the mainland, um, the the Azores. I'm not sure the name of, of the headquarters there, the um, capital city there, and then Madeira, mm -hmm. you know, Funchal, where we are. And, and there's a president of each of these three. They're all part of the EU, and they're, the two islands are, or island groups are part of the larger. Uh, Portugal uh, entity, which is is part of the EU, mm -hmm. uh, which creates a lot of interesting things, as I'm sure you spoke about with Andre. Andre we but, did, yes. Yeah. We talked about Madeira and Free Madeira and, yep. and what exactly. they're doing here and what the president was doing. So, yeah, yeah. it's super interested. So, um, we're in a very interesting time <laughs> where yesterday we saw... Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin hitting 64,000. Right. Number go up. <laughs> and the numbers keep going up. It's crazy. And yeah. I think this is going to put the conference on a very interesting yeah. key as well. And I just want to start with a short intro for those sure. of my audience that don't know you. So Lawrence um, is the founder and managing partner of Equity Management Associates. Correct. Focusing on monetary debasement insurance through investments in gold, silver and Bitcoin. Correct which is very unique. Maybe, you, yeah. I don't think you see many investment... No, uh, that's true. A lot, of, a lot of Bitcoiners don't like gold. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. I, that's one of the reasons why I wanted specifically to talk to you. Sure. Larry is a formerly, formerly in venture capital, right? Yep. You used yep. to be an investor. I was a venture investor. capitalist for a long time, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, he's got his BA in economics from Colgate University, yep. received an MBA with academic distinction from Harvard Business School. Yep. And you have a really long bio because you've done a lot of things you're one of the I'm veterans old. in this, uh, in this <laughs> that's space i'm 66 years old <laughs> and and i think that's amazing you add and, stuff up right <laughs> and and that's the that's exactly why i wanted to talk to you because you have this perspective i think that not many people have in right. the industry yeah. it is a youngish industry yeah, I mean, with a lot of young people there was no bitcoin right exactly yeah and you have seen a lot before right Right, exactly. and I, I've seen you in some documentaries, yep. and I've been following you throughout the years. Yeah. So I've seen the work that you've been doing, and you're really a gold guy. Like, right, you I'm, came a from I'm, gold. I'm a converted gold guy. I mean, before one has to remember, and, and I know a lot of Bitcoiners are young and don't necessarily always focus on this, but before Bitcoin, 
gold was sound money. There wasn't. It was the only good choice before Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Bitcoin's going to replace that, but um, not overnight. <laughs> yes. Not overnight. And uh, uh, yeah, there was a whole sound money movement before Satoshi did his thing and gifted us with uh, the invention of Bitcoin. And uh, you know, I've, we've been fighting. You know, I mean, since '71 when we went off the gold standard. I mean, I was a teenager in '71, but. The point is that, that uh, you know, sound money is, is a, an old concept, or it's a concept that's been around a while. Austrian economics has been around a while, mm -hmm. and because uh, a lot of the great Austrians lived in the 30s and 40s more than today. Um, and as a result, um, what's really exciting for us older gold guys is like the reinforcements arrived. You know, we've been, we've been fighting this battle for... You like know, in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. We've been we, waiting for we, the... Yeah, we've been fighting this battle since 1971, wow. you know, on and off, and it got cumulatively more heated. I would say we were kind of winning, but kind of losing. I mean, it's been an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. And then Bitcoin came along, and it's like, oh, my God, we got this really, really good weapon, you know. And, uh, and then what I think I've said this in other podcasts, what really shocked me and I found just, you know, fantastic was... Suddenly, I've got you know twenty and thirty year olds you know quoting von Mises to me, right? <laughs> and it's like you know I, I used to go out and talk about Austrian economics, and people's eyes would glow, glaze over and like, oh yeah, old gold guys, sound money, who gives a shit? But now you know this. What, probably one of the greatest things Satoshi's done is he woke up an entire generation to the monetary debasement scheme known as Keynesianism, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. for us, for those of us who were open minded and could see that it was a better form of gold. Um, we were like, wow, this is great. You know, we've got reinforcements. <laughs> yeah. so. And that's really exciting. Right. And, you know, the, the reason why I asked you to be interviewed, Larry, is because yeah. a lot of my audience is uh, gold admirers. And sure. they're buying gold now because they're understanding what's coming Absolutely. or they're starting to understand Absolutely. what's coming. Absolutely. And I'm very happy about that, and I encourage that. Sure, I mean, it's better, I, than, better than fiat. <laughs> exactly. I talk to them about that, yeah. about preserving their wealth and hedging their yeah. hard-earned uh, savings yeah. from all, all the years that they've worked really hard. And we do value gold as money. And then when I introduce Bitcoin to them, then, you know, the usual suspicion creeps Absolutely. in. Absolutely. And it's very hard for them to grasp that, mainly because of the fact that it's not tangible, they can't see right. it, they're not technological. Exactly. There, are, there are many Yeah, Sam Bankman Fried, yeah, all, Bankman all, the, Fried. All, the, all the bullshit and shit coins. Yeah. And the only way I can explain it to them, like starting to explain it to them, is that this is digital gold. Exactly. And that's exactly what it is. That's right. I mean, and I'd love so, your Yeah, your Satoshi attention. created digital scarcity and, and gold had value. Gold always had value because it was the most scarce element in the universe, mm -hmm. you know. And so, over five thousand years, human beings figured out, you know, the supply of this stuff is growing very slowly, and therefore it's a good thing to have as money because it maintains its value because you know you don't have sudden supply shocks. I mean, although historically you did have some when, you know, when the California gold rush came along, they, they found a lot of gold very quickly, and there was some inflation as a result. But was but that the, a fluke or? Yeah, mm -hmm. it was. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was kind of a fluke or it was just a one-time event. I mean the. Mm -hmm. Same, similar thing happened in, to silver uh, in the, I think it was the 1500s when, you know, when the Spanish opened up the New World and robbed the, you know, the Inca Empire of all of its silver. There was a big influx of silver into the European market and that created inflation in silver. But the point is that, yeah, I mean, and, and that's kind of what I see my role as, Efrat. I mean, I, I um, you know, there, there are a lot of different people in this movement. Everybody's kind of got a role to play. Mm -hmm. And what I've tried to do is orange pill gold bugs, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I, I love Michael Saylor. I really admire him and respect him a great deal. But when he said gold was the enemy, you know, I took offense to that because, um, I mean, he's right. It's a it's a superior, it's an inferior choice to Bitcoin. But by saying that, I think he offended a lot of gold people. And I think I think gold people are one of your most natural converts. Exactly. Because exactly. they already understand the problem. They just have chosen the wrong solution. And it's not entirely the wrong solution, it's just the lesser solution. Mm -hmm. Because gold in nominal terms is not going down. But definitely. Uh, definitely not. I mean there are eight billion people, it's been money for five thousand years, you know, huge, huge Lindy effect. But you know, it's a it's an inferior solution because Bitcoin is a better form of gold with a with a limited supply and you know the gold supply will continue to increase from now until forever, although you know, slowly, at uh, 1.7% a year, which is similar to the dilution rate that we're at for Bitcoin right now. They're on parity in terms of dilution. In the halving, which we know is coming in six weeks or so, or a tad more, 
um, the the hardness of Bitcoin will improve. You know, at 450 coins, then the dilution in Bitcoin will be one half the rate of the dilution in gold. And of course, that continues with every halving. So, um, but as I say, you know, I, I view my role in this whole revolution as trying to bring the gold people along, trying to yes. help them to get it and to understand why. They don't necessarily have to give up all their gold. No, but, I hold gold. Yeah, we I all love do. gold. Exactly, we all do. But but they should to have zero Bitcoin exactly. is crazy because they're they're missing the sharpest you know spear in the whole in the whole arsenal. And so I you know I went into gold shows like the New Orleans Gold Show. There's a speech on the web you can Google. It's still there, and I'm proud of it. Where I, I stood up in front of gold people and said, Hey guys, you got to wake up. You know this is I mean the gold's great, but you're missing so, you know you're missing something here. This is. <laughs> This is really good, and you're pay attention to that one and you're, too. And you're going to regret it if yes. you don't if you don't have some of this. And and to their credit, I mean, at, at most of these shows, I often will if I'm asked to speak, I will often ask the audience. I'll look at them and I'll say, "How many of you guys have Bitcoin?" Mm -hmm. Half the hands go up. Wow, yeah, that's right? impressive. It's, it's impressive. And, and generally speaking, the people who attend gold shows are over 50 years old. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't find millennials. Exactly. You don't find They're millennials old. going to gold shows. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you're old and you're older and you think about how does one protect against debasement, well, gold's a natural choice. That's, yes. And so they all get it. They trust it. It's tangible. You know, I mean, it's, we all know what a gold coin is. It's, it's, it's a thing of beauty. And, and I would never denigrate gold. I mean, it, it, it's compounded at 7% a year since forever, uh, which kind of tracks with monetary debasement over the time period, although, you know, one could argue that the inflation rates are not correctly calculated. But, but the point is that it does protect you to a some degree against debasement, much better than most other things you could choose as investments. Um, but Bitcoin's a better choice. And the reason Bitcoin's a better choice is that it's really got two curves going on. The one is the, the, um, you know, the debasement curve, which is to say you know, the, money, the, the government can't stop printing money. We know that, and they will. And so they're going to debase the currency. But the flip of that is that um, Bitcoin's also got an adoption curve going on, as we know. And so... There are 8 billion people. There are 21 million coins. Some of those have been lost. There are 56 million millionaires. Not even every millionaire in the world can own one Bitcoin. Yes. Right? And, and this, this is extremely compelling. This is <laughs> so rare it's and rare, scarce. It's rare and scarce and not going to change. And so we finally have a perfect form of money that you know, will ultimately be deflationary money. And that actually matches the way the world operates, as Jeff pointed out in his book. Mm-hmm. Right, which is to say that you know technology and improvements in, you know, the way humans operate and have productivity leads to a natural rate of deflation, and the money should reflect that. Mm -hmm. And a big part of the conflict we're facing right now is the fact that the money does not reflect that, and just that we, the opposite. it's just the opposite, right? And so they have to continually debase the money to keep the damn system going, yeah. and that has all the pernicious effects, which you know you believe in, and I do too. Which is, it just it takes from the poor and it gives to the rich. Because they know how to play the debasement game. They borrow cheap, they buy real assets, the assets appreciate in value, the money depreciates, they pay back the debt with money that's worth less, and they come out far ahead. And the average working person who's not sophisticated enough to do that, doesn't know how to do that, can't borrow cheap. I mean, because US, the U.S., for example, the average credit card rate, now this blows my mind, is 20%. Interest wow. on credit cards, right? I mean, like the mob, right? I'm sure there's some that are cheaper, but I'm talking about an average now, right? So if you if you if you get credit card debt and you don't pay your balance every month, you're paying a 20% interest rate, right? It's a lot of money, and it's it's criminal. And yet, you know, for the for the years of ZERP, which were 2008 or nine to 2015, Wall Street could borrow money for you know 50 basis points, mm -hmm. zero, you know, half a percent or less mm -hmm. in some mm -hmm. cases. So. What that allowed them to do was, you know, to borrow a ton of money, buy all the good assets, and drive those assets up in value, and then they can pay back their debt with appreciated assets, and um, you know they end up with all the wealth, and that's why we've got this incredible disparity. And you know, it's incredibly unfair that we have a base layer of money that's so distorted, and that robs from the working person. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why. You know, the promise of Bitcoin is not just as an investment, and it's going to be a fantastic investment, but set that aside. If, if all the money could be evenly distributed and Bitcoiners weren't going to get rich, you know, kind of in this next turning of events, would you vote, you know, to, to have a Bitcoin standard and have sound money? Absolutely, because it's really the having the system be fair that's going to break a lot of what's wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. And it's going, to, you know, it's going to reduce poverty, it's going to reduce wars. When, when, you, when you start off with an unfair monetary layer, you know, and, you, and you embrace theft, and you have governments that embrace theft, 
that in and of itself is not right. Yeah. And it leads to all kinds of bad outcomes. And so, and we've seen those. And that's why around the world today, there's a lot of discontent. And, mm -hmm. and, and sadly so, right? Well. I want to ask you, the Keynesian economy, <laughs> for my uh, audience that don't know what it is, yeah. and, and I encourage you to go and learn, is the system of economy used around the modern world today, basically. Yeah. It preaches for growth, continuous growth, right? right? And you said in one of the podcasts that I heard you yeah. uh, speaking, the healthiest economy isn't about a growing economy. It's about an efficient economy, exactly. getting more for less based on productivity, sound money, correct pricing. Correct. You said the core problem is that the money is not sound. And yes, we find ourselves fighting over everything else, unaware about that correct and you called it also funny money right it's it like is. it's not even money anymore it's not even money anymore. what is it the the way we live today it's broken it's just it's it's um it's 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 money by a government that cares about perpetuating itself mm -hmm. and so you know i mean the ppp loans i mean i have wealthy friends who had businesses that didn't need them they got them and kept it you know, um, the student loans. I mean, I just saw on Twitter there was a guy who had half a million dollars in, you know, he was a, he's a doctor. So he took out student loans to get a medical education. He must mm -hmm. be making good money. Most doctors do. Mm -hmm. And they were forgiven by the government, you know, right? And so how do the people who had to repay those loans feel? You know, how unfair is that, right? And, and you know, everybody says, well, whatever, that's good for him or it doesn't cost me anything. But, but it does. I mean... It does because, you know, that's why gasoline is $5 a gallon. Exactly. You know, it, it costs you because, as we were talking before we started, you know, a good steak is now, you know, 60 bucks or something. I mean, it, it's, I mean, I, I, in a prior podcast I was talking about, and when I was a kid in the 70s, you know, gasoline was 25 cents a gallon, right? I mean, one quarter, which was silver, one silver quarter would buy you a gallon of gas, mm. you know, and ironically, a quarter of an ounce of silver today will still buy you a gallon of gas because silver is $22 and a quarter of an ounce of silver is worth five bucks. But not in fiat. But not in fiat. <laughs> no. no, no. No, no. I mean, you know, but the whole price level was different back then. My first job was I was, I was a dishwasher. I was making a dollar ten an hour. So, you know, I mean, that was a minimum wage, right? So, you know, it's, look, it, fiat, fiat is something we've all learned to live with, but we shouldn't. Mm -hmm. We really shouldn't. Yeah, we and take it for granted. We take it for granted. It this, should be this there. Is just, it should be this way. This is just the way it is, and the system's broken. And but we've got to, you know, what are you going to do? You got to live with it. Um, but the fact of the matter is, we really don't have to live with it. If we had sound money, um, people could earn money and know that what they earned would retain its value. Yes. And that is incredibly fair, and and it and it, and that it levels the playing field. And they wouldn't have to chase on the next investment that That's will right. beat inflation. That's exactly right. And, and they real estate, gold, whatever it is. Whatever it is. I mean, everybody, everybody gets sucked into. And stops. you know, the, yeah, the fact that your money is losing value, you know, causes you to go and do irrational things like gamble in stocks or gamble in things you shouldn't be gambling in. If you knew that your money wasn't losing value, you could just hold on to it in the yeah. savings account. Yep. And knowing that you were going to have the same purchasing power in the future that you had today, so um, you know that's that's a good thing. In turn, you know at the government level, let's just step it up one level. You know the government in the U.S. already, and in most countries in the world, is now extracting between 30 and 50 percent of every productive human being's labor, so to speak, in the form of taxes, and that's before the monetary debasement. Mm -hmm. So we've now, let's say you're at 50% rate, which a lot of Europe is, and some parts of the U.S. are, depending on what tax, what state you live in. So, you know, if, you, if, if the government's taking half of what you earn in terms of taxes, and then they're debasing the balance, you know, by 10 or 15% a year, I mean, the government's now bigger than all of us, which makes no sense. And what that allows them to do is, you know, wage wars and, you know, spend money on stuff we don't need, and, you know, I mean, we've got the U.S. has the, you know, the biggest defense arsenal ever created, and we don't need that. And we should be, you know, working towards a unilateral peace, you know, treaties and, you know, uh, elimination of nuclear weapons and the kinds of things that will create a sustainable planet for mankind forever. You know, but instead, you know, just to, to serve, you know, the Dick Cheney's of the world, 
and the Halliburtons of the world and the, you know, the wealthy defense contractors, the Nikki Haley's of the world, you know, we were, um, you know, we were floating a blue water Navy all over the world and, and you know, trying to defend the dollar. And, uh, and not doing a very good job of it, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of countries are yeah, leaving. A that. lot of countries are leaving it. And Janet Yellen just said we're going to seize the Russian assets and give them to the Ukraine. And uh -huh. you know, and, and guess what? You know, there, it's America is what 300, 300 million plus people, and um, you know, the world's eight billion. And the other, you know, the other seven billion get to vote. And uh, you know, they're going to they're going to soon vote. You know, in favor of systems that aren't necessarily as American dominant, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And um, and that's probably a good thing. Not probably a good thing. It is a good thing. Uh, and, you know, in my view, if America wants to maintain its position of, of, of leadership, of uh, country leadership, it needs to adopt a Bitcoin standard. You, you think know. that's realistic? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not anytime soon, sadly. I mean, ask Elizabeth Warren, right? She's the senator from Massachusetts. I mean, you know, there, there are people in the U.S. federal government who do understand that Bitcoin's important. There are. It's really? Not, oh, yeah. Jason Lowry, who's a guy who works at the Pentagon and works, um, you know, did a lot of work. You like Jason, right? Yeah, did a lot of work at MIT on it. He gets it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of the military gets it. Um, Senator Lummis gets it. Um, there are a few others that get it. There, there's the old sound money gold crowd guys. They're starting to get it. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, sadly, you know, we should do it right now and we would leapfrog China and Russia because China, Russia, and India have all bet heavily on gold. Oh, yeah. Big time. And, which is another, you know, support for the investment case for gold. Um, but, but I think they've wrongly bet on gold. They should be betting on Bitcoin. And if we were to bet, on, if the U.S. were to adopt a Bitcoin standard, we would leapfrog them massively. Uh, but again, and at the same time, they're all also developing their CBDCs. Yeah, well, that's right, and that's they all which are. Which is fiat on steroids. That's really. exactly. That's just that's just an evil form of fiat where they can see everything you're doing, control you, say, oh, you can't spend money on that, etc. And you know, the good news is, though, there's within the U.S. anyway, I don't know about other countries, I don't know about Europe, I don't know about Israel, et cetera, but uh, there's, a, there's a lot of CBC, CBDC pushback. I mean, you've actually seen, I mean, Vivek. Um, in Israel, there isn't. In Israel, there isn't. That's <laughs> no, sadly, there's yeah. no awareness of yeah. it. Oh, that's too bad. I'm but, the only one writing and talking about is it, that right? more oh, or less. Oh, I that's, mean, that's me a, and a few other crazy really ones. That's really sad. <laughs> yeah, well, in the U.S., I mean, like, you know, RFK, he gets it. I yes, mean, there yes, are, I There know. are people in the U.S. who get it. So. DeSantis. And yes, DeSantis gets it. Yeah. Yep. Even um, Trump said Well, they're working on him. I mean, I, you know, he didn't go that far. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. He, he went from, you know, it's, it's evil bullshit to, you know, okay. I mean, I think Vivek must have gotten to him a little uh -huh, bit, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. um, and, you know, he'll blow with the wind. I mean, he's a political creature. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. It's, um, there is pushback. So that's, that's yeah, there, good. There, there is pushback. And, and by the way, well, I'm pretty sure Wall Street's motives aren't pure. But the fact that Wall Street has embraced this thing with these ETFs, We've actually now got people who have skin in the game and are making money off of it. And, you know, BlackRock's a big, powerful entity, right? And so... Some would say even some dark. Would say, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Argu arguably quite dark. Yes. But having said that, you know, if they're running the largest Bitcoin ETF, you know, the whole notion that they're going to outlaw Bitcoin starts to become a little bit more of a stretch, and right? They, and Bitcoiners always say they can't. They can't really take it well, down, it, right? Effectively, they can manipulate in a absolutely. way. Absolutely. Well, what I like to say is they can throw a lot of sand in our eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, they could tax it. They can, I, I think they're going to try. I mean, Elizabeth Warren wants to ban self-custody. There's no way they're going to get that through. But I bet what they do do is I bet they're going to make us report what we own and where we own it, okay. and maybe our addresses and stuff. I mean, is this the, similar to the gold uh, well, that, era in nineteen seventy? I was going to say, I was going to say, pre seventy four, you couldn't old, own gold in the United States. You don't have to report the gold you own now, but one thing you do have to do, um, I know because I did it for many years, is that if you have a bank account in Switzerland, you have to file a form with the federal government saying that you have that mm -hmm. bank account. And the reason they argue that you have to do that is they want to, they want to. They want to understand if you're possibly dodging taxes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, and I think that'll be their argument. They'll say, look, okay, fine, you can hold your Bitcoin, you can self custody it, that's all fine, but you need to, you, you can't just do it anonymously. Declare you, it. You, you need to declare it. You need to tell us that you have it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, as recently as a couple of years ago, you may, you're probably not aware of this, you're not a U.S. citizen, I don't think, but a couple of years ago, they had a check mark on the IRS uh, tax form that said, Have you been involved with cryptocurrency this year? Mm -hmm. uh, that's an interesting data point. And it's, uh, right? it's a wide question. What is involved? You know, like, yeah. what do you mean yeah, by do that? Do you own it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Did so, I sell it or did yeah, I buy it? Or yeah, right. Am right. I just holding so, it? 
So, you know, they, they, look, they're going to try and pry around. And, and it's not impossible that they try a 6102. It's, I mean, I, I rate that as less than 5%, but it's not impossible. I think there's a chance they would also maybe do something along the lines of, you know, these gold and Bitcoin people are really, really damaging our monetary system. We, don't, we want to discourage holding that. And if you hold it, the tax on that stuff is going to be 70%. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, again, though, as um, my friend Chris Irons likes to say, it's a slippery fish. You know, I yes. mean, how many of us? OK, so they want to know that I own some Bitcoin. Hmm, should I tell them? I don't know. Um, you know, they want to they want to tax it at 90 percent. Did I sell any? Did I sell any overseas? I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's not so simple. Right. Yeah. I mean, as those of us who understand how it actually works. Yeah. Understands that if you've got understand that if you've got 12 words, you got 12 words. That's it. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it's a big world. There are lots of countries. There are lots of places you could go. You know, so I, I, think, I think to the degree that they really get draconian on some of this stuff, I think the, the noncompliance among true Bitcoin is going to be massive. It's going to be absolutely massive. But what it argues for, and this is, you know, talking to the gold people. So gold people come into Bitcoin. Their, their first choice is going to be, well, let's go just buy an ETF. I right, got the broker right, and you know, yes, you know and where I'm we, going. Yes. We got we got to warn against this, Keep right? Going. Yeah, we got to warn against this, right? Because, you know, you buy an ETF, and guess what? You know, BlackRock owns it. BlackRock knows where it is. The government knows where it is. You sell it, you pay tax on it, and if they do decide to do, fees if they do well. decide to do a 6201, 6201 is the act where uh, FDR grabbed all the gold in 1933. If they do decide to do that, you know, it's going to be really simple for them. They're just going to go to BlackRock and say. Give, give, all, us all the, give, give us all this. We're the just, identities of yeah, everyone who, that holds. Yeah, who an owns issue? who owns these shares? You know, we're going to. And then in the fine print of the ETF, yeah. it says that you can get fiat if you're not well, getting the asset in a in a sense of emergency. Or exactly. Something, right? This is force majeure. The government changed the rules. You own hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. You'll receive a wire transfer for hundred thousand tomorrow. And of course, the next day, the price of Bitcoin will be a million dollars, but you won't own it anymore, right? And so, so this is why. You know, if you truly believe in the nefarious government scenario, which I think you have to, you know, you have to consider there's some possibility that that does occur, not zero probability, then, you know, you really have to learn to become self-sovereign, which is to say you've got to get your own hard wallet, you've got to yes. have your own cold storage, you've yes. got to have your own keys, you've got to have the ability to control your own coins. Um, so that, you know, if the government decides to become malevolent, which is entirely possible, your defense is, you know, screw you, government. I'm not playing. And yes, yeah. it does force you to sh to uh, discover more sovereignty, to discover more yeah. responsibility. Well, that's right, and that's not it simple. It forces you. That's not, and that's not simple, by the way. I mean, I I spend a decent piece of my days. In fact, I did it this weekend. I, I spent an hour on the phone with a boomer who's a gold yep. guy. Yep. Walking him through how to set up his treasure. It's not easy, but it's not hard either. It's, it's not hard. It's, but it's, it's not easy for people who are not used to technology. If you're afraid of computers, and, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're willing to learn and just repeat things over and over again, it's quite simple. And so, you know, we set up his Trezor. We got him his 12 words. We didn't send any coin to it because the fees were quite high. But I said, okay, now we're going to wipe out your Trezor. And we did. And then I said, okay, now we're going to restore it with your 12 words. Right. And we did. And I said, all right, you need to put a tenth of a Bitcoin on there, or, you know, a hundredth of a Bitcoin on this Trezor. And you need to go through this five times where you wow. wipe it out, restore it, wipe it out, restore it. And then what you, you know, when that's you get done, confidence. when that's done, you're going to have real confidence that those 12 words will allow you to be anywhere in the world with a new Trezor or another BIP39 device. It's not just Trezor. And suddenly you have access to your wealth and nobody else does. And unless you tell somebody that you have those coins, which you're under no obligation to do, or, you know, they get your 12 words, which, you know, obviously you've got to be extremely careful about that because that's a nuclear code. Mm -hmm. You are self-sovereign with your money. Yep. And it's a thing of beauty. And right? I'm sure he hugged you by the well, end of that Well, he was greatly appreciative. He, he, was, he did say it was quite confusing. And I said, look, I, like I say, you know, you're going to forget this. I mean, I've just taken you through it. And every time you had a problem, I could help him with it. So you need to repeat it. So, you know, put this on your calendar for the next five weeks. Every weekend, you're going to wipe out your treasure and restore it. Wipe out or your just trust. start sending money. Yeah, start well, that's buying. right. Or start start, start doing every week. start doing small transactions. I mean, the problem is back when we were doing this four or five years ago. I mean, the fees were just so de minimus it didn't matter. And, you know, th it, there will come a time when doing an on-chain transaction will be rare. I think for an individual because the cost will be too high. But hopefully by that time, Fediment will be up and running, and all the elect or all the um, Lightning solutions will be widely 
adopted that make it very easy to do transactions at very, very de minimis fees. I mean, that's, that's coming, but, you know, we're still, we're still in the very early days. So early. Yeah. You know, I come from a tech background, so startups you know, background. Right? You know, with a very mature ecosystem of, of tech companies. And I came to Amsterdam, that was my first Bitcoin conference. Yeah. And I saw some startups and I heard, I, I had a sense of the level of the maturity of yeah. the ecosystem. And I was amazed. I said, what? This is it? There is so much to do. Yeah, right. You guys, if you're entrepreneurs, if you're like Keys, this is the space for you to be in. Absolutely. There is so much to develop. Yeah. Oh, Marketeers, yeah. we need you. Salespeople, yeah. we need you. Like yeah. there is oh, so yeah. much to do for techies to, to so come into I, the game. I was a venture capitalist in 81 ish. And, um, you know, the, the, at the time, the IBM PC had just came out. Do you know what I mean? And I went to, I remember Mitch Kapoor coming over and showing us what a spreadsheet was on Lotus 1, 2, 3 on an Apple II. And I was like, holy shit, this is going to change the world, right? And, <laughs> yes. and, and I watched each of these evolutions Amazing. of graphic cards and printers and, you know, floppy disks and then hard disks yes. and then memory. And, and I was also heavily involved in the internet and, mm -hmm. you know, plug in the phone into the dial-in modem and do, 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 you know, and wait for that. And and I, yeah. And it was all green screen before the browser came out. And, you know, th yes. I mean, we're we're still we're like in early, early, early Internet. days. Yeah. yeah, and 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 just as we describe that self sovereignty process and how it's difficult for an older person who's not computer savvy to get a treasure and start going down that road, um, you know, that'll it was get the that'll, same. it was the same back yeah. then. And, yeah. and, and and but that you know that'll get solved. I mean, I had my first internet address in 1993. You know, and it was through CompuServe and it was dial up. And, you know, and I got it because a guy I was doing business with said, well, I've got to send you some files and I'll just send them to your Internet address. I was like, what the hell is that? It was really, it was a riot. And I was like, and I, he said, well, you got to go to CompuServe and get Internet. It's a system that was built by, you know, uh, DARPA and the, and the government. And it, it allows you to, he, he said, at the time we had something called Novell. Do you remember Novell? Yes, were you, were you yes, around there? Yes. Novell was email within an office. Yes. You know, you could hook all your computers up. But, and he said, well, imagine if you had Novell and you could send email to anywhere in the world. And I was like, oh, fuck, that's <laughs> really powerful. And so I went back to the guys I was working with. I said, we got to find out where this Internet thing is and invest in it. And so we started buying Internet companies in 93 and 4. And, of course, that, really, wow. that worked out really well. Right? I, but but, but I, I bring that up not to brag about that as much as to say this is the same thing. This, yes, I mean, this, is, this pattern, is where we're at. This is where we're at. It reminds me of the exact same point in time where, you know, it's still – I mean, the Internet kind of got going, 95 with the browser. I had a public offering, Netcom went public as a dial-up service provider in 95. It was the biggest deal of the year. And then after that, it started to kind of spread. And yes. so it's, I mean, we're, maybe we're in 96 or 7. And let me just, j just add on to that. In the year 2000, I was 20 years old. Okay. I worked, it was one of my first jobs. I worked as an instructor and a trainer for people to understand what is internet, what is the mouse, what is email, <laughs> what is a www address, what? and how do you use it? And I taught them what the internet right. was. And it was the HTTP um, yep. era. So yep. I taught them yep. what links are and how they and surf and what's a search that's engine. That's as late as 2000. Right? That's 2000. Right. Yeah. And I was a teacher back then. Right. And, and this is where we're at. Right. We're teaching people what's a wallet and right. what's the address that's a, that's and how you move money. And that's exactly right. Imagine where we're going to be in 20 years, well, in 15, in 10 years in with 10 the years. speed that, it, that it's yeah, going. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, everyone's going to have this. Everyone's going to know what a SAT is. Everyone's yes. going to have a wallet. Everyone's going to be moving money around. I mean, you know, I, I was in business school and, and my friend was, um, my, my roommate was a guy who had gone to Harvard College. And he, he room, he was, his roommate was a guy named Steve Ballmer. Who was, <laughs> and, my, and, and I'll never forget, and this is 1981, and Balmer had just joined Microsoft. Gates had given him 10% because my friend had helped him negotiate the deal. And we were walking along the Charles River, and, and Balmer was saying, You know, Larry, this thing is going to be in every single house, in every single person in the world is going to use MS DOS. Wow. They're, they're all going to have it, they're all going to use it. It's going to be the base layer of what you're going to use all these PCs for. And I'm sitting there thinking, Well, hang on a second. This PC is kind of good for word processing. And I just learned, Mitch Kapoor just showed me that maybe I could do a spreadsheet on it. Why does, the whole, yeah. why, why does the whole world need that? Uh -huh. what, what the fuck? I mean, Steve, I think you're nuts, man. But, but, but it, I mean, he, was like, he was like, no, you got to buy our stock. And I did. He's like, but you got to buy our stock because this thing, it's going to be enormous. Everybody is going to need this. You can just see where the technology is going. And 
it's very rare in life that you kind of get a second chance, right? I mean, I, I bought some Microsoft. I wrote it for a while. I sold it because I wanted to buy a condominium. It's a big mistake. <laughs> um, and, but, but, you know, the bottom line is um, this is the same thing. Yeah. This is the same thing. I mean, and it's to anybody who's watched how te technology is developed, you can see it's just it's obvious. It's absolutely obvious. And that's why I implore older people who are afraid of technology, afraid of digital money, believe in gold, don't think this is money because you can't touch it and feel it. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, fine. I, I get all those concerns, but if you take the time to learn about it and you really watch what's happening and you watch the consistent growth, what I call the dogs eating the food, and, and to me, that's the most important thing. The number of addresses is growing, the number of users are growing, the number of transactions are growing, hash rates growing, all those things are growing. What's going to change? Mm -hmm. What's going to stop that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. 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 It's just going to continue. It's sometimes faster, sometimes slower. You know, there will be problems. Sam Bankman Fried comes along. Everyone thinks that's, you know, crypto. Everyone thinks that's real, you know, right? I mean, <laughs> there, were, there are definitely things that have effed us up. Yes. But, but they don't stop the underlying no. fact that this technology is going to be ubiquitous in 40 years. And everyone, we're going to be on a SAT standard. Yep. Everyone, the dollar won't exist. Yep. Everyone's going to be paying for everything in SATs. And that's that. I mean, it's just, that's how it's going to happen. Now, you know, when, how fast, well, you know, a lot of variables, right? Yeah. So, Larry, and, and that's where I want to take you back to what's happening right now. What do you think is the probable scenario that we're going to see now? Is it a collapse that we're going to see? Or yeah. is it a more inflation? Is it kicking the so, can down the yeah. road? See, where, see, where do you yeah, think we're going? Let's go through the possibilities yes. and talk about probabilities because nobody knows. And, you know, and, and there could be some dark stuff here, and, and I hate, you know, discussing that because, you know, I, I, the one term that people in have used... In my podcast, that, you can yeah, yeah. discuss well, dark but, stuff, yeah, but, <laughs> well, but and we always end up on a hopeful message. Yeah, exactly. So. We'll end up on a hopeful message, and I mean, I think we'll probably have hyperinflation, but... And people say, well, you're being a doomer. And, no, I'm not being a doomer. I'm very optimistic about where this goes on the other side, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, yes, I'm a doomer about the current system because the pattern of things that we've seen is very reminiscent of other countries which have had hyperinflation, yes. okay? So... How do we get from there to there and how does it unfold? None of us know, first of all. Start, start there. I've always been too early and too aggressive about how quickly it'll happen, so I condition everybody to take my recommendations as perhaps being too early. But um, I think we'll continue to have high inflation, and that will become a problem. The, the biggest unknown that we, none of us can predict in terms of micro moves is government action. Yep. We don't know how scared they'll be, what they'll do, if they'll try to tax it, how much sand they'll throw in our eyes. You know, if they'll embrace it, I doubt that. Yeah. So we don't know about that. Um, they could try a reset. I think that's unlikely. My, here's my base case. You think it's unlikely they'll do a reset? I think it's unlikely. I don't think they're smart enough to figure out that's what they need to do. In the U.S., but what about other countries? So other countries might do it. it might do it. Might okay. do it. Somebody else might adopt a Bitcoin standard. And then, then you get into, yeah, interesting game theory. I mean, there's an argument in a lot I've heard that I think is pretty credible that Russia's probably mining Bitcoin right now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's I saw Snowden to, talking about a country yeah, that's right, doing it. Yeah, right, exactly, right. Um, I think that this monetary system will fail in a very high inflation slash hyperinflationary event mm -hmm. within before 2038, and I've been on record as saying that. So this is a fourth turning. There have been other fourth turnings in history. They tend to last as the shortest ones like seven or eight years in the Civil War. Longest ones are 10, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Let's assume this is as long as, as any other one, and let's assume that it started in 08, and I kind of think it did. I think, the, I think this fourth turning is all about sound money, mm -hmm. and so I think the sound money crisis, it, you could argue it began in 1998, 2000, you know, with the bailout of LTCM, but I think that was small. I think it really began in 2008. We did a lot of unprecedented things, QE, printing money, et cetera. And so if it started in 08 and it lasts 10 years, it would have been over by 2018. Well, obviously that didn't happen. If it lasts 20 years, it would be over by 2028. That could still happen, actually. Okay. If it lasts 30 years, it would be over by 2038. So somewhere in the 2028 to 2038 time frame, it's probably going to happen. Uh -huh. One thing I've said on other podcasts, and I do strongly believe, it could happen faster this time for one particular reason, and that is we're all so socially connected and we're all so kind of instantaneous information you know, in terms of just time travel and how quickly the word gets around. And it was amazing to me how quick the Silicon Valley Bank fell, mm. right? One week, they marked down their bonds. A few analysts do the math. Oh, shit, this thing's got a $20 billion hole in its equity balance sheet. A few venture capitalists hear that. They call their friends. They send out emails and wire... One tweet and one, emails. They wire, 
And in one day, they had, they had roughly a $100 billion deposit base. In one day, $45 billion got moved out. Wow. That was a $45 billion, half their money, $45 billion bank run in one day. That was and, just clicks of the mouse. attribute that to the speed of information transfer. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's social media. It's information mm -hmm. transfer. It's the, it's the world we live in. And, and, what, and I want to emphasize, what happened there is the people involved who had a deposit there realized they could lose their deposit because it wasn't insured. It was above the insured size. Yes. And Dodd-Frank said they should have lost their deposit. Of course, that didn't happen because they changed the law, as they always do. But, um, but and, and they, they said, hey, you know, get your money out of this bank because you might lose it. Uh -huh. and, and it spread like, and so they all, you know, a social consensus quickly developed that said, this, this bank is going under. I need to get all my money. It was a bank run. It was an old-fashioned bank run, except it wasn't the Bailey Savings and Loan. It was Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. and it happened in, in two days. In two days, they were out of all their money, and they were bankrupt. And the government had to take it over, and we all know how, what happens. But the point is, imagine the same thing happening with respect to the U.S. dollar, right? Mm. Imagine the same wow. thing. You know, the government just announced that they're going to send X amount of money to everybody and that they're going to print this much on the balance sheet and they're going to send out all this money, you know, right? They're, they're doing all of this on the next crisis. And, and suddenly, literally, everybody goes, oh, shit. I know what that means. We're screwed. We need you know, to we, we, I need to get out of these dollars. I've got... You know, I've got a million dollars worth of bonds. I need to, you know, for sale. So. You know, I've got a million dollars worth of Apple stock. I mean, you might mm. hang on to that because Apple's a real company. It'll reprice in the new currency. But for sale. You know, I've got a bank deposit of X amount for okay. sale. You know, and, and what do you sell it for? You know, gold, silver, Bitcoin. You know, and so the Bitcoin price goes from, and how will you know what's happening? The Bitcoin price, you'll, you'll truly have the ultimate God candle. I mean, you'll go from, you know, 200,000 to a million in two days, and there won't be any offered, you know, right? Think about it. And, and some people won't know what's going on, and some people will be afraid to pay the two million. Do you think the price of gold will also go? Oh, yeah. Like oh, yeah. Okay. Sure it will. Okay. Sure it will. Because, because again, you can't, and you can't print silver. Same thing. Okay. You can't print it. You know, real estate. I mean, in, in Weimar, Germany, when this was occurring, yes. people got paid. And they literally went to buy whatever they could buy, even if they didn't need it, mm. because they knew it would cost more three days later. Mm -hmm. So maybe only potatoes were on sale. They didn't need any potatoes right now, but they could trade potatoes for coffee or whatever the hell, it, you know. And they went and they changed, you know, what's the price of those potatoes per mark? Done. Sold mm -hmm. to you. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't want to hold the mark. Mm -hmm. Just like the guy at Silicon Valley Bank said, I don't want my deposit there. i got to get it out because it's going to become worthless. Yes. That's the thought process. And that, that what I'm describing at a micro level is what the larger rule is called Gresham's Law, which is when people panic that the money is no good, the people sell the bad money mm -hmm. in exchange for a better form of money. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, um, and that's what drives the hyperinflation. It's every, t every time, every place, everywhere. And so what is it really? It's a psychology thing. It's a social psychology of a, of a, collective. a, a collective quorum of the people come to the conclusion yep. that the money's no damn good. And, and, and they just out of, it's like, you know, a tiger is coming in. It's just out of self-preservation. You're like, I got to get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's a panic. Mm -hmm. It's a legitimate panic. And this is why people in the Bitcoin world say, this is going to happen slowly and then it's going to be suddenly. And one of the mistakes a lot of people are going to make is, let's say we do have a God candle. Let's say Bitcoin does go to $200,000. And there are going to be a lot of rich people who are going to say, well, I mean, I, I had a friend recently who said he didn't want to buy it because I told him about it at 25 and now it's 50. I can't buy it. It's up 100%. No, you idiot. You know, it, it's, going, it's going almost, it'll go infinite in, in fiat dollar terms. Yes. And that's why, unless you really understand what we're talking about here, which is that the fiat system will ultimately, utterly, completely fail and the dollar won't spend anywhere, mm -hmm. then you're going to be afraid to pay whatever the price is that's being asked for it. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, as this occurs, this is where I can imagine the government stepping in. You know, you're, start, you're starting up that curve. They see the problem. And maybe they do what they did with gold. Mm -hmm. Maybe they create accounts in the Cayman Islands. Maybe they fund them through unlimited backdoor printing press, Federal Reserve, and um, all the other central banks in the world, the BIS. Mm -hmm. And maybe they go into the Bitcoin futures market and they sell a fucking shitload. To try and influence. To, to, to try and influence the price uh -huh, uh -huh. and panic us. Maybe they float a rumor that says, 
Uh, this Bitcoin price, be careful. It's it's really, really dangerous. And then two days later, they announce media propaganda, uh, big, big media propaganda. We're going to put a 90 percent tax on Bitcoin and Bitcoin's at 800,000 and it falls to 400. I mean, it could get really hairy and really volatile. And right? the army of Bitcoiners have to stand strong then it, and blind, well, right? All, that's right. And well, and, and those of us who are truly hardcore are going to be like, yeah. You can't scare us with that. You yes. can't scare us with that shit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you know, the newbie who was scared and bought it at 400 and watches it drop to 200, they might be scared out of their mind. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And they might be tempted to sell yes. at 200. Yes. I mean, one of the, you know, look, volatility is a Wall Street game. Mm -hmm. And these guys know how to play it really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to try and use it to take away your Bitcoin. And if you understand the meta game that's being played, you won't fall for it. And if you go yes. to my Twitter feed and you see the chart of the price of gold in Weimar, Germany. I saw Germany, it. I right? saw it the yeah, other that's, day. That's yeah, a yeah, Dan yeah. Oliver. He's a good friend. A volatile as hell. Absolutely. Before the Weimar. Absolutely. And so, you know, buckle in, mm. right? And get prepared for that because it's entirely possible that we're going to see some of that. Wow. It's, it's entirely possible. And, you know, I mean, look, it, 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 it just is what it is. What I would hope would be that they would slowly but surely embrace it and would it would grow in a controlled manner and that we would just eventually, the dollar would die a slow death and, and you know, Bitcoin and sound money would replace it. And I think that's a possible outcome, too. And here's what happened to me since I got into Bitcoin not long ago, yeah. less than two years ago. That the moment I had some money in Bitcoin... I stopped caring about the dollar price of it, the right. fiat price of it. Exactly. And I was in and I said, okay, now I get why they say one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Because right. the moment I'm in the system, I already have a footprint in it. Right. And if something happens, I can exchange some of my Bitcoin, not for fiat, with other people in the community. Absolutely. I'm outside of the system. Correct. I'm in a parallel reality, Correct. if, if you want to yep. call it that Correct. way. And that's why it's one to one and not right. one to whatever, 60,000 or 200,000. I don't care how much it is in dollars. I can live a different life. I can exactly. be in a different system. Exactly. And that gives some uh, relief, it, 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 it I, gives I think. You, it, it gives you comfort that you've got a form of money that over a longer time frame will protect the fruits of your labor and and you know the money that you've been able to save that's the real thing and so you know people just they have to be, you have to be calm about it and that's why I really I do advise dollar cost averaging yes um, you know and I mean I know people there are people here at this conference who you know they got into it late and they bought it you know 50 or 60 K and they watched it go to 15 and I'm sure that was no fun for them mm -hmm. you know but they kept dollar cost averaging and now they're way ahead and um, you know, and that's just, that's the way of it. You have to understand what it is. You have to understand why you own it. And you have to believe in how inevitable it is that it is ultimately going to be, you know, it's, as Sailor says, going up forever, Laura. You know, it'll be a couple hundred thousand a coin, you know, probably in the next few years, you know, maybe sooner. Um, it'll be a million a coin with probably within five years. And then it'll be two, three, four, five. I mean, it's just going to keep going. Wow. And so, yeah, it's wild, right? And you know, 56 million millionaires, 21 million coins. Not even every millionaire can have one coin. I mean, there will come a time, people will be watching this 30 or 40 years from now, it'll be like, being a whole coiner will be just like an amazing thing, right? You know, and, and yet today, you can own a whole coin for the nice of a very, the price of a very expensive automobile. Mm -hmm. it used to be a cheap automobile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At 20. Yeah. Now, 64, yeah, that's a pretty nice car, but, yes. but the point is that, um, you know, one coin is not out of the reach. Not yet. Um, not yet. But but it, but it, pretty soon it probably will be. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's certainly a coin at a million. That's not going to be that's not going to be easy for somebody. And and the the ironic thing is, I think a lot of the wealthy in the world are going to because they don't understand it and understand the nature. They're always going to feel like it's too expensive. Yeah. It's gone up too much. I don't want to pay that. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's not the right lens to look at it through. You got to look at through what it what it is and where it could go. Many people want to know what can happen to their pension funds. What do you think about that? Historically yeah. speaking, you know, from your experience, you've yeah. seen yeah, some well, things. Yeah, well, I've seen a lot of things. So the pension system, it's, it's a tragedy. I mean, people should, first of all, people should never trust any pension fund or any system like that because it's just, that's all political nonsense. And I can't tell you how many cases there are. It's like there. an ideology. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just can't, it's just sad. The people... 
I can't tell you how many, um, you know, everyone should try and be self-sovereign. Everyone should try and worry about their own economics. If you want to, if you want to have, know you're going to be financially secure in your retirement, have a lot of kids because they'll, they'll take care of you. Mm -hmm. if, if you run out of money, they'll take care of you. Right. I mean, and that used to be, uh, that's, the, that's the old world model of how you retired, right? Right. You had a big family. A big family. You, yeah. you knew that, you know, I mean, you might become infirm, but you know, some, your youngins weren't going to be, and they, they'd help you out. Um, but pension funds are a scheme and sadly, People have fallen for it, and people, you know, there's so many cases in the United States. People work their entire lives for a company, and then the company got LBO'd and bought out, and pensions, and they get a fraction of what they were supposed to get. And I mean, you know, the the American Social Security system is a scheme, and it's a it's a Ponzi, and you know, people paying into it, they, I'm, you know, they're never going to get out what they pay into it, and it's probably, you know, it's, it's projected to fail in the 30s, and I think it probably will, if not before then. I think that people have self-controlled pensions or self-controlled investment vehicles. I mean, one of the beautiful things today is that until, you know, a few months ago, um, you couldn't put them into Bitcoin unless you wanted to buy MicroStrategy or GBTC, which is the Grayscale Trust. And now you can buy an F, you know, um, a Fidelity, which is the one I like. I, I don't like BlackRock. I don't trust BlackRock. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Mm -hmm. um, I trust Fidelity, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I know Abigail Johnson. I know who she is. I know what she's about. I watched them in 2008. They never used derivatives. Um, you know they're they're privately owned. Um, I just I, I think Fidelity is a legitimate, honest operator. She's been in Bitcoin a long time, and so if I were going to buy an ETF, which I would never recommend because you're not controlling your own keys, but understanding that some people need to take baby steps before they take full steps, um, Fidelity would be my first choice um, strongly. Um, and then some of your pension would go. Yeah, and so to the degree that you can push your pension people to put some of their money into Bitcoin, that's something that should be happening. I mean the. You know, Kelsters and Kelpers, I mean, if I were a retired teacher in California, I'd be writing to the pension board saying, how much of my pension is in Bitcoin? You know, and I'm pretty sure if they replied, the answer would be zero. Mm -hmm. And then I think the next letter would be, why? why? <laughs> this, this, this is the best performing financial asset of the last 15 years. Is there some reason why we don't own this? You know, what, 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 what am I missing here? <laughs> right? You know, the Sharpe ratio is higher. I mean, it's it, on, on so many bases, it's just better than the alternative. So... So your first view is don't have any pensions. My at first all. view is don't have any pensions. The second view is if, if you have you one, have don't to... don't count on it being worth a lot. Yep. The third is if you can control it. You know, I, I've had some people have asked me say, well, I've got I've got money in a pension. I got you know I've got these three buckets. I can do cash, bonds, or stocks. And it's like oh god. I mean, I, I say, is there any gold choice in there? Any Bitcoin choice? Because the answer is usually no. And I said, well, the bonds are like no. Don't even. There's no way you're not going to the bonds. Um, and then I say, how fast can you draw? I mean, sometimes I can make an argument for the cash, but generally speaking, the stocks is usually the best choice. And the reason the stocks have some, you know, benefit over cash is that even in a hyperinflationary event, they will maintain their value in the sense that they will. A company is a company; it has assets, it has it has earnings power, and even though the currency may get destroyed, the company on the other side will still be there. There'll be a new currency. The company will price its products and services in that currency and the stock will retain its value. And the reason I know this, or one of the reasons I believe this, is that in the, in the Weimar example, Siemens and Mercedes-Benz were two of the companies that were publicly traded pre the hyperinflation. And if you owned those stocks and you went through the hyperinflation, I think at times in the hyperinflation you would have been wiped out on paper, very, very much reduced because there was just nobody had any money in the stock. But if you held them for a long period of time, you know, not that long, and things recovered, you know, and, and, and there were probably other companies you could have owned that would have failed. In the hyperinflation, but let's say you own Siemens and Mercedes Benz, you can't. You came out whole on, yeah. the, on the other side. Eventually, those companies operated again. They made products again. They priced them in the new mark, and the they profits didn't collapse. And they didn't totally collapse. Okay. Yeah, they didn't totally collapse. So, so equities. There's a case for he holding equities through hyperinflation. So, I mean, on a real basis, I think they don't really do all that well. But at least on a nominal basis, you you kind of make it through. I mean, the Venezuelan stock market did extremely well when they had hyperinflation. Uh, not on a nominal basis, not on a real basis, mm -hmm. but you know it's better than I mean real everybody who held you know the what is it boulevard whatever the hell they had I mean that, those were wiped out um, so yeah it's it's tough the other thing is real estate I mean it's the, the, that was my next question yeah, yeah. real estate I mean it's, look they're not making any more of it there's only X amount of land I mean the problem with real estate from the time when my parents did it and they bought a, a modest house in the 60s for 50 grand and by the time they sold it, it was worth a million or something 20 bagger you know, because of the inflation of the 70s and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, you know, their taxes were quite low. Teachers weren't overpaid. The cops weren't overpaid. The, the, the town they lived in wasn't 
corrupt and run poorly, et cetera, et cetera. The problem with real estate now is the taxes have gotten so high. You don't really own these properties anymore. You rent them from your city. In the U.S. anyway, and particularly in the higher income states, you've got just these very bloated you know, municipal school and cop and you know, fire structures where people can work for 20 years and retire at full pay. And so, you know, there, it's not uncommon in the United States to have people, and this isn't true in the Midwest as much, but in the eastern on the coastal states, it's not uncommon to have a house that has a 20, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollar a year tax bill. You know, and that's, I mean, that's, that's absurd, right? So real estate, one, obviously you can't move it. That's a negative. So if your country goes socialist or completely, you know, the wrong way, you can't take that wealth. You've got to sell it. You can't easily move it. And two, you know, you know, I think the way the monetary system is failing, I think it's very safe to assume that all governments are going to become very grabby. You mm -hmm. know, that they're going to... And they can do it for real estate as well? And they can do it for real estate as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not a big real estate fan. Can you describe fan. quickly just for the audience that is not from the U.S., because I have yeah. a lot of European audience, what happened in 2008, just so that they know in, in the great financial collapse? Yeah, sure. So, so, so the, the dot-com bubble in the United States was a very big bubble, mm -hmm. so, centered around, which was centered around something real, which is the Internet. But it got way carried away, and companies were trading at 100, 10 to 100 times revenue. So it was nuts, and we all remember it. And uh, the bubble burst. And, um, you know, it was very specific to the NASDAQ, but the NASDAQ fell 80% in value. The S&P fell 50% in value. And so Ben Bernanke, who had made his career out of studying the Great Depression and saying to Milton Friedman, we'll never let it happen again, uh, came in and, and, and said, well, I, you know, I've got the solution to this problem. We just we need to make money cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, and he gave a helicopter money speech in 2002, which goes down in my mind as one of the most irresponsible things the central bankers ever said. And he took interest rates to zero or 1%, close to zero. And he and Greenspan encouraged, Greenspan before him and then ultimately him, they encouraged people to take out home equity loans and borrow and, and to speculate in real estate because they said, wrongly, prices of real estate have never gone down on a nationwide basis in the United States. It was a lie. It, they did in the Depression, but they were thinking more modern times. And so everybody began speculating in houses. Mm -hmm. And with 0% interest rates or 1% interest rates and a home equity loan, you could you know buy a house, borrow against it, buy another house, rent it out, buy another house. And this is how, you know, you've all seen the great short movie. This is how you had strippers in Las Vegas that owned seven houses, right? Yep. <laughs> and, um, and because they figured it was a no-lose proposition. The houses were only going to go up in value. They'd get these rents out of them, blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, it got carried away, and that blew up. And meanwhile, Wall Street had enabled all this by selling these CDS you know, securities, which was insurance that made these crummy mortgages look better than they really were. Mm -hmm. And AIG was the biggest guarantor of those, and Goldman Sachs had bought all the protection from AIG. And, and basically, once the house of cards started to fall, it just completely fell in on itself. And so AIG would have failed, and basically every Wall Street bank was completely bankrupt because they had all sold this paper. They would have been sued. Um, they were all highly leveraged. They, you know, they couldn't meet their obligations, etc. And so Hank Paulson went and begged um, Nancy Pelosi and said, we need this thing called TARP which is 700, you know, just made up a number. We need $700 billion, and we need to backstop all these banks. And we need to guarantee all their liabilities. We need to bail out AIG. We need to bail them all out. And they created a lot of other pro programs, many multiples of names and, that went along with that. But they basically socialized the losses of Wall Street. And Wall Street, and this pissed off many, many Americans, and rightly so, Wall Street got completely bailed out, and two years later, you know, Lord, you know, Lloyd Blankfein, who ran Goldman Sachs, was, you know, making hundreds of millions of dollars a year again. And Jamie Dimon was, you know, making, making himself a billionaire off the cheap options that he'd reset in 2008. And all these guys had gotten <laughs> fabulously wealthy because, you know, they had a great business model, as, as Elizabeth Warren said. One of the few things she said that's correct, where she said, they have a great model. You know, heads we win, tails the government bails us out. Right? I mean, yeah. that, and that's really what it was. And yeah. so, so that created enormous, that's, that's, that was the beginning of the American public becoming enormously pissed off. And many, many people and, lost their and rightly so. Yes, and that's the other thing state, I, right? that's the thing I forgot to tell you. I mean it happened to one of my sisters that, you know, people who had, you know, believed in all this, had, had read the false signals and thought, well, okay, my house is going up in value. They'd taken out notes against it. They got caught up in it. They paid too much for a house, they levered the house too much, whatever it might have been. The bank and, has asked for and, and the, the bank, money. The bank asked for the money, you know, and... And, and then they, they seized the properties? They didn't have it, properties? and they were, yeah, and they were forced to seize the properties. And so... And that's, that could happen again? It, there's no doubt it could happen again. There's no doubt. So, so the, you know, it, it, it was a very bad thing that, that occurred, and it was, it was control fraud. 
And it was very obvious. No one ever went to jail. I mean, Angelo Mozilla, who was out there at Countrywide, you know, which went bankrupt, um, you know, humping the shit out of these cheap mortgages and telling everybody to get, you know, levered and so on and so forth. They all, they all made millions, in some cases billions, you know, on something that was unsustainable. It sounds kind of like our fiat system, right? And, and when they hit the wall, when it hit the wall, the government said, don't worry, we got you covered. And, and they printed the money to bail them out. Now, the thing is, we're going to hit the wall again. It's not the same model because it's not a housing bubble this time around. It's kind of an everything bubble. Everything bubble. But we're going to hit the wall again because the debt, and we're, really it's happening at the sovereign debt level. And the most notable place where it's happening is the United States government. Mm -hmm. right? We've got $34 trillion of debt, a trillion dollars of annual interest expense, and we are going to hit the wall. Yes. The deficits are growing. And eventually the bond market is just going to say no mas. I mean, the inflation is here. I'm not buying these bonds because I'm not getting a reward for it. And the government is going to have to do what all governments put into that position have historically done in the past, which is they're going to print the money to pay the interest and to pay off the bonds. Yes. And once that becomes obvious, this is back to the Silicon Valley Bank example, once that becomes obvious to a quorum of the people that the government is going to print the money to pay off the bonds, to keep the system going, and they can never stop, Everyone's going to say, why am, I holding this, why am I holding this money? Yeah. It's just that I can't keep holding this money. It's not going to hold its value. And so that's... It's like that, a penny drop for a collective at the same time. Exactly. Sector. And that's, that's, where the next one, that's where the next one is coming from. Now, I can't tell you when you know, March of 2023 happens again. I don't know. That could happen in a year. That could happen in eight years. But... The math of the situation suggests that unless they do a restructuring very quickly or they get fiscally responsible very quickly, both of which I think are pretty unlikely, mm -hmm. that it's coming. And that's what so strongly supports the sound money thesis. And, and you know, with, with gold and Bitcoin and silver being kind of the, the three obvious choices, I recommend everybody have a mixture. I mean, you know, gold, if you're older, particularly if you're over north of 60 or 70, Keep in mind that Bitcoin has had big drawdowns. I think they're getting smaller. You know, they've had it's drawn down 90%, 80%, 70%. Well, you know, if you're 75 years old and you've got a couple million dollars of wealth and it's all in Bitcoin and it draws down 70%, that's not going to feel really good. Okay, gold has never drawn down 70%. Mm -hmm. Biggest down year for gold, you know, last is like 20 some odd percent, 24 percent or something in the last you know 30 years, and and it recovered you know after so. So the point is that if you know, if you can't stand the volatility of Bitcoin, you know, gold's a very good second choice because it will go up with debasement and it doesn't have as much downside. What I say to older people is the way to deal with the volatility of Bitcoin is you just take the weighting down. You don't want to have 100% of your assets in something that can yeah. go down 70% exactly. because that would scare the shit out of you, exactly. right? This but if, you, I mean, if, if, if the average person had 10 or 20% of their assets in Bitcoin, I think they'd be shocked at how well they're going to do. Yeah. Because I think someday that 10 or 20% would be 90%. Mm -hmm. It's going to grow that much. In value. And so that even if the other stuff doesn't really work, it will have done its job, which is it will have protected them. And I, and I say to people who can't, don't want to buy any, I'm like, come on, you can afford to lose 1% of your net worth. If you're in the stock market, if you're in bond, you're any, you can afford to lose 1%. Of, you can afford to lose 2% of your net worth. I mean, Bitcoin goes to zero and you lose all that money and it's 2%. You're still fine. And the flip of that is, there's, I think Bitcoin's going to go up 10x, 100x, 1,000x over the next 30 years. So you really want to say, small you, price you, to yeah, you really want to have a zero allocation? I don't know. It's I mean, aren't smart. you? Yeah, that's not smart. I mean, yeah. you're, I think, you know, in investment, I mean, I know from being an investor my entire career, one of the things you really want to try and avoid in investment is what I call regret, which is where you look back and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> You know, I should have. I should have. I saw that. And I should have. Like my, selling Microsoft, I have a regret, <laughs> right? Yeah. And if somebody comes to you and they explain Bitcoin to you, and you kind of get it, but you don't believe it, and you're kind of worried about it, and you're thinking, and you're, you say, all right, fine. I'm not telling you to put all 100% of your money in there. I, that, that's not what I'm asking. But you now understand it. You kind of get the thesis. And you think there's some possibility that's correct, that Larry's correct. Well, and if, if that's true, and 20 years pass, and it's worth a million dollars a coin, and you didn't put 1% into it or you didn't buy a coin or whatever it might be, I mean, you're going to probably experience regret and say, Jesus, I heard about that and I didn't buy it, mm. you know. But if you put the 1% in and you lose it, you know, you're not going to experience regret. It's kind of like, well, I lost 1% on something that sounded pretty interesting and, I, you know, it didn't work. But so, you know, again, it, it goes to the asymmetry of the bet. 
Mm -hmm. and, and if you really look at all great investors, all people who've made money by investing their money wisely, they've, they've picked asymmetric bets. Mm -hmm. Because nobody knows what's going to happen in the world. Nobody. Me, nobody. But you can kind of get a sense. You can kind of predict and you can kind of... And so what, you know, you're like the card counter you know, that, that wants to get the, the table set up in a way so that the probabilities favor that you're right. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case... You know, I think you've got a very high probability that this thing is worth multiples of its current price, a very low probability that it's worth zero, some probability that it doesn't go anywhere. And so, you know, multiples of the current price, you know, that, that, will, be, that will be a very high rate of return. You know? And then for those who are looking at it purely from a, a price or money perspective only, when we're talking about Bitcoin, I think what they'll discover is that they come in for the hedging, or right. for the opportunity to make a good investment, yeah. and they stay because they realize that it offers so much more in That's terms right. of values That's right. and sovereignty. That's I mean, right. I came for the hedging, I stayed for the freedom. That's what exactly. I always say. That's a great line. Yeah. That really is a great line because, yeah, I mean, it's look, the hedging is nice, and, and you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not complaining about the fact that this will be a good investment. But it really has, in my mind, and for me anyway, it's become much more than that. It's become, you know, at, at, a, at a kind of either a, a spiritual level or at a, it just at a, at a political level. I actually kind of equate Bitcoiners. I, I like the analogy of Bitcoiners are the American revolutionaries and, you know, the non-Bitcoiners are the royalists, right? <laughs> and, you know, the revolutionaries had a better idea. You know, we don't want to serve a king. You know, fuck that. We're not, you know, no, represent, no taxation without representation. Fuck you guys. And... <laughs> And Bitcoin is the same kind of way. And it's, and it's not just, you know, we're going to be richer for doing this, but it's like just a general principle, we're not going to let you guys control the money right. and, and be the rich guys. And so we, we want to fight back. We want a system that's fair. And, and this a, is a system that's yeah. fair. Yeah. It's a real tool that yeah. we did not have before. Exactly. To create I mean, said fair system. Exactly. Yeah. And so whether we, whether we get rich or not, you know, give us this fair system because that's what we want. Yeah, you're right. It, you're, people's views on it do evolve, I think, as they get more and more into it. And, yep. and once you start down the once you start down the rabbit hole and you read more and you listen to more and yes. you know, it's just it, it just it kind of compounds. Larry. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, it's funny. So I mean, much content, it's amazing. No, I don't but... want that. But I, I, you know, the you get more and more orange pilled. I guess is the best way to describe it. I yes. mean, I you know, in 2013, I bought my first coin, 300 bucks. And I was, you know, I was, it was to me, it was a speculation. I didn't understand. I was afraid that internet money wouldn't work. Um, well, it was, and it was. I think it was a fair concern at the time, sure. you know. Sure. And um, but I kept, you know, you learn, you read, you evolve, and and you know, even I mean, as recently, I mean, I've, I've said this many times. I'm I'm about fifty fifty gold Bitcoin, but I I will say this: as I earn money, I'm still buying Bitcoin. I'm not buying any more gold. You know, the, I mean, yep. I've got enough. Yep. It'll be great for bribing the border guards. <laughs> right? You have the coins. I have the coins in my pocket because yeah. they're not going to be smart enough to take a lightning transfer. No. You know? It's like, here, let me across the border. You know, here's five, here's five ounces, right? And uh, wow. it'll, it'll, nice. it'll, it'll, it'll have value, and, and that's that. I mean, it, you know, so. But you do keep buying Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, I definitely keep buying Bitcoin. Like, it's the best form of savings there is, I mean, without, without a doubt, so. Are you going to keep moving around between conferences and talking and doing podcasting? Yes like, and no. I mean, I'm following you, and you do a lot. Yeah, I do. I don't know. I do less than others. I, I, yes, I will to a degree. I'm, I'm trying to dial it back a little bit. I, I'd like to. One of my good friends says, you know, you got to improve your OPSEC. I mean, if you're in the military, you know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, it's, um, you know, I'm kind of out there. And, um, you know, I, it's. I actually feel like I've done a lot of the heavy lifting for the last, I mean, I've been, I've been working on gold bugs for a long time now. Had a big debate with Peter Schiff. I converted Chris Irons at the Quoth the Raven. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm 66. And, and I, may, I may dial it back a little bit. I may become a little bit less available, a little bit less present. I, you know, my wife wants to travel. Um, she's right. She's right. Right. I mean, <laughs> yes, you know, she's, right. she's like she's voting for experiences. I'm I'm good for experiences. You know. Yes. Yeah, right. And I want to do it while I'm still healthy. You so. need to get to Copangan in Thailand. I'm yeah, yeah, you. yeah. That, yeah, you you convinced me. I'm going there. Oh yeah. I'm definitely should. going there. So, um, yeah. So it, it, you know, I, I may dial it back again, but but I do believe strongly in it, and I, so I'm not I'm not ever going to completely give up on it or completely fade away. Yeah. Um, and I, I you know I'd, I'd like to I'd like to try to influence um, the politics of it all. I mean, I think, I think, you know, I still, 
I still believe America is savable. Yes. Um, some people don't. I do. And I think there are a lot of good people in America. I grew up in the Midwest. I think, I think most of America is incredibly solid. I think there's a piece of America that's not very solid, but they're going to get schooled. <laughs> and I think that most, most Americans, when presented with the correct evidence, will do the right thing. Mm. And so I think ultimately, if, if I do attain wealth through this thing, to the degree that I could use that to maybe influence you know, the political structure of America and trying to make, you know, put America back to what... I grew up in an America that I love that was great. I mean, the 70s weren't perfect. There was Vietnam War, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I know the history of America very well. And I think, in general, it's a pretty admirable, good history that you can be proud of. You know, I mean, we did some bad shit. But, you know, the Indians, I get it. <laughs> you know, but in general, I'm pretty proud of America. And, uh, and I'd like to see it get repaired. So you know, maybe I'll shift my focus and go a little bit more in the political direction in the future. But Nice. Yeah, but it's, it is what it is. Um, Where can people find uh, Yeah, so I'm on, I'm on the Twitter a lot. Everyone knows that who's listening who hasn't heard of me. But just my name, Lawrence Lepard on Twitter. I make a lot of noise. I'm not very nice to the central bankers. They deserve it, uh, in my opinion. As mother said, you know, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Well, I, I violate that every day <laughs> with respect to central bankers. Uh, you can and, also put Larry's name on YouTube, and you'll find a yeah, lot of Yeah, there's a lot interviews. of stuff on YouTube. I do a lot of interviews. Um, I have a website. I read a quarterly. My, I manage a fund that's gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Um, the, um, the fund is called the EMA GARP Fund. Uh, there's a website, ema2.com. Um, we write a quarterly letter. It's a macro letter. It's free. Mm -hmm. You can email, sign up for it. We'll, it'll get sent to you automatically. We'll never spam you. Um, and so that kind of gives you, if, if you're interested in kind of what I'm talking about in terms of where are we in the macro world, once a quarter, my partner and I, David Foley, really great guy, uh, we write this quarterly letter. It's 20 pages long, and, and it's designed for our investors, but it also uh, helps you know anybody else, and it's free. Great. You know, and I'll, I'll probably be back talking to you again in a year. <laughs> we should. Yeah, absolutely. We definitely should look forward follow to up it. and do, yeah, do yeah. it again. Thank you so much. Oh, you're for your welcome. Time. Most welcome. This really, was really so enjoyed. insightful. Oh, uh, you know. And I love it's, the. It's amazing the to me that people there. want to listen to this stuff, but. Of course. I, you know what? It, you know what it is. If you hang around long enough. You know, people think you've got gravitas, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, if you're 66, it's like, I'm just a regular guy. So, but you also draw strength from what's happening now, I think. Oh, if yeah. You're seeing, yeah, yeah, like, no. a, a oh, renewed yeah. hope. No, no, no. With, no. I was, after 2008, I was despondent. I was, I mean, that, that radicalized me for sound money. I was like, I can't believe these fuckers got away with it again. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, I was just like, I can't fucking believe it, you know? And, and then... You know, and, and, and one of my friends, a really good, a really good guy who wants to remain anonymous, came and said, said, Larry, 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 these fucking Bitcoiners, they got these really great spears, and they're running up to charge the castle, and they got torches and shit, and they're going to burn the entire fucking place down. <laughs> I'm serious. And I was like, you know, I was like, are you sure? And he's like, absolutely. You got to study this thing. It's unbelievable. Wow. And, and, and he was right. And he was a 100% gold guy. Uh -huh. I mean, 100%. And he, he dumped all his gold. And he went all Bitcoin. Wow. Yeah, and to be frank, I kind of wished I'd done the same thing at the time. <laughs> but, you know, here we are. And, and, I was, and so I rode two horses. I rode gold and Bitcoin. Yeah. For, you know, because I wanted some diversity. So here we are. Here we are. Yeah, it's oh. okay. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So really much enjoyed for your time. it.